web components for micro front ends on this episode of Blue Collar Coder. Welcome back. This is the third of three videos on micro front ends. We've been learning about micro front ends by building the same proof of concept on three different platforms. The first was open components. The second was single spa. And now we're looking at web components. So what you're looking at here is the web components proof of concept. It's a product detail page or a PDP if you prefer. Bracketing the content are the header and the footer. Then we have a cute picture of a dog we can adopt. That's the product image section. And then to the right is the call to action or the buy tools if you're looking at the code. You might use these handy buttons on the right hand side to select the dog. Or you can click on adopt the dog if you want to adopt that dog. And as you can see when I press that button, the number in the header goes up. So impressive application? Nope. Not until you find out that the header and the footer are implemented in Vue, the product image is in vanilla JS, and the buy tools is in React. Now it's interesting. So if you're like one of the five people that watch the other videos, you probably think you know the data flow here. I'm going to throw you for a loop because it's different in this one than it has been in the others. In this POC, I've actually implemented two different data flows, and the one we're looking at here is a model view controller flow. That's something you don't see a lot of nowadays. So you have a model, and it's got the cart count, and then the image and description of the dog that you're looking at. And then we have a controller that adds event listeners to the buy tools and then sets the header when it's called back from those event listeners. I can use this model because web components, or really custom elements, are just like HTML elements and I can control them directly. You can add properties, change attributes, set event listeners, just like any other HTML tag. It just so happens that these tags are written in either Vue, React, or Vanilla.js. Now for this example, I use what are called dumb components. They don't know anything about the model, they just work off of attributes and properties. There's a corresponding set of smart components that do know how to connect to the model, just like Redux components connect to a store. All right, enough chit chat and architecture, let's look over at the code. So I'm going to start with the MVC code because that's what I've been talking about. And that starts over in controller.js where up at the top we have our data model. Then we grab references to all the components. Then for the header, we set the current count and add an event listener, which is going to be called back when I click on the buy tools. And that increments the count and then sets that in the header. You could also use function props if you want. It's really about getting the API of your custom element to kind of feel like a regular HTML element. If you're building a custom element that's a carousel, build it the way you'd expect to see it in the W3C spec. That'll make your developer customers happy, and it'll make it easier if later you decide to swap out React for Vue or Svelte or Vanilla.js or whatever. Next, we go over to index.html. This is the host page. At the top, we have a little CSS to just set up the grid layout, and then we have our tags, our custom elements, down in the body. Then we bring in externalized view for the view components, and we bring in our component code, and finally, the controller code. So when it comes to putting components on the page, we've looked at three different approaches, open components, single spa, and now web components, and this is by far the easiest way to put components on the page. It's just HTML. Okay, now onto some component code. We're going to look at Vue first, and then React, and then Vanilla.js. So, Vue. This is a dumb version of the header. It's a Vue CLI app, but I added a web component wrapper, and that's over in main.js. And that web component wrapper then wraps the header, and then I register that wrapper as the component. And the header component itself is just very simple Vue. We have a template at the top, then JS with the count property that we're expecting, and finally some basic styling. Looking at the smart version, it's exactly the same, except that instead of taking a property, it first creates its own state with a count of zero. Then when it's mounted, it adds an event listener to the window to watch for an updated count and updates the display. And through the 
coolness of two-way data binding, it just magically works. The way that we make a custom element or web component in React is a little different. It starts over in index.js where we define the custom element. This class's job is to first create the shadow DOM and then render the element, then unmount the component if it itself is unmounted from the DOM, and then finally render, which renders the component into the shadow DOM. So no fancy, easy to use wrapper like we had in Vue, but at least in this case, you know what the custom element is doing because you wrote it. A little bit of a bummer though, because if you want to have props and attributes, then you're going to need to store those in this object and then pass those on to the React as properties and attributes, but you're going to need to ma manage that for yourself. So definitely more work to do in React. The actual code is really simple. In this case, we just have a layout and we dispatch custom events for the button clicks. But, and here is the twist, we have to use the composed key and set it to true on those events. That way, the event will pass through the shadow DOM boundary. Without it, the shadow DOM would just block the event and it wouldn't go to the listener. So remember, that one, right there, composed. It's the linchpin of emitting events from custom elements. Finally, let's look over at the vanilla JS version. Now, this is just a regular custom element. We have a template at the top. Then at the top of the class, we tell the system that we want to listen to any changes to a prop called source or SRC. And then in the constructor, we create the shadow DOM and then clone that template into it. And then we set the image source to our source attribute. We then have getters and setters for source. And finally, we have the change watcher that sets the image source when the attribute changes. And that's it for the code, my friends. But let's go and add another component, just for kicks. So we also have the dog's name. So let's create a new vanilla dumb component for that product description or name. So I'll copy and paste the code from the original product image, then make some changes to show the currently selected name. Then I'll bring that into index.html. And finally, I'll hook it up in controller.js. So let's have a look over in the browser. And if I did everything right then, hey, que bueno, nice. So now that we've had a chance to look at open components, single spa, and web components, let's put together a little comparison chart. Okay, let's start with loading the code. With open components and web components, that's on you. So I'll give that one to single spa because it uses system.js to handle a lot of that. Versioning. Open Components does a great job with that. And I'll add another check mark because it's got a really super cool component registry viewer app that comes right along with it. Setup, so that means starting up the components and giving them their initial state. Um, they all do that, but I think actually Web Components does it a little bit better because it's got that whole HTML integration that feels really native. So now nesting. What if I have microfees within microfees? Well, I know Open Components has some code for that, but you may need to invoke that yourself. I don't think Single Spa likes nested components. I'm not sure, but I didn't see any support for that. But Web Components, because they're just custom HTML elements, work just fine. In fact, they have first-class support for slots and all that. Mutability. That means, can I adjust the components at runtime? Externally. So like through props or attributes or things like that. I think only web components do that. Next, routing. Single Spa does this really well. It's even got cross-platform support for all the different frameworks. Next, shared vendor bundles. Yes, my friend, if you're gonna have 15 different React MicroFE components, you do not want to load React 15 different times. You'll need to externalize React, 
and probably Lodash and any Atom element libraries you have. But that's something you're going to need to do across the board with all these different stacks. So we'll put little exclamation points on each one. Do this! And finally, standards. I got to give this one to Web Components because, well, it's an RFC standard. It's a real, you know, standard standard. I mean, the others are well documented, but Web Components are a standard. So obviously, I'm not going to make this decision for you. It's early days yet. But you've got a lot of great options here for how to implement micro front ends. And what I will say is I've had a blast investigating these technologies. I'd never tried Open Components or Single Spa, and that was really fun. I've done four videos and a few lectures on Web Components, but I've never used React or Vue to build one. So I think that's really cool. To me, micro front ends are the answer to the everlasting tech gobstopper that are front end frameworks. You built your web app two years ago in cutting edge Angular, and now you want to try out React, but you don't want to port the whole site? Micro front ends! You have five teams building microsites, and they need to share a header and footer, but they'd rather do like a rusty spoon death match than use a shared library? Micro front ends! You're a SaaS company that wants to give your customers widgets to embed in their experiences? Micro front ends! Micro front ends are a thing, already. And they're going to get to be more of a thing as time goes on. So I hope this video has been helpful in trying to understand them. Of course, as always, the code is up on GitHub, and you're welcome to use it, fork it, PR it, whatever, as you please. In this video, I really didn't go through the smart component flow all that much. You might want to go check out the code and try it out for yourself. Well, let me know if you liked the video by liking, subscribing, or leaving a comment. In the meantime, I'll be off building another blue-collar code video.